Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of the Olive Forum. I hope that you all had a nice evening. Thank you again to our hosts at the DCT Abu Dhabi for the lovely, lovely evening. And tonight uh, we have more great visits and meals in store for you. But let's start with the morning's plan. So in a few moments, we will start with our opening plenary, followed by a short coffee break and then some workshops. And then in the afternoon, we're gonna all come back in here for the closing for two plenary sessions and closing remarks. Now, just uh, a quick reminder that when the uh, events are done today, uh, then there'll be transfers back to the hotels. You'll have about half an hour to 40 minutes to freshen up, get your bags if you're checking out, and then to catch the shuttle bus to the Louf Abu Dhabi for the visit, followed by an evening cocktail at the Art Lounge. So, let's get things started. I'd like to call to the stage, please, Stéphane de Courtois, who is the moderator of the first session. Mesdames et messieurs, chers amis, c'est un honneur pour moi d'animer ce matin le premier échange de la journée en séance plénière autour de la question « Quand la protection du patrimoine construit la paix ?» La protection du patrimoine dans les zones de conflit semble When protecting cultural heritage builds peace, while the protection of heritage sites in conflict zone might seem obvious nowadays, that wasn't the case for decades. We witnessed destruction of the Buddhas of Bamiyam, the Sufi mausoleums of Timbuktu, and the temples of Bil in Palmyra. Only then did we realize that heritage could be directly attacked as symbols of dialogue between cultures. Those monuments aren't only stones, but the trace of an ancient history, a continuity with our ancestors, and a landmark for future generations. We also know that the difference between tangible and intangible heritage can be questioned. This was stressed yesterday morning. We shall discuss these notions as well as the anticipation of the needs of preservation, like oral memory, living languages, the necessity of inventories and documentation, as heritage also has enemies other than war, like poor urban planning, lack of education, ignorance and identity-related tensions. Allow me to call on stage Madame Aparnatandon, Mrs. Christa Picat, Madame Christa Picat, Monsieur Vincent Cayol, Mr. Vincent Cayol, Monsieur Sotos Ktoris, Monsieur Sotos Ktoris, Monsieur Sotos Ktoris, effectivement, Monsieur Jacondir Kaidarov, Monsieur Jacondir Kaidarov, Dr. Sotos Ktoris, et Miss Aparna, uh, et Monsieur Vincent Cayol. So our first panelist this morning will be Abana Tandon that I will call on this uh, pupitre in order to do a presentation. Uh, you work for ICROM for many years. You are senior program leader, uh, first ed and resilience for cultural heritage in time of crisis, which uh, is from what I understood the flagship program of ICROM at the moment. ICROM was founded in 1956, five member states at the beginning, 138 now. Your action, Aparna, is mainly to explain that heritage is not a concept frozen in time. That's really attracted my interest, but the result of a socio-cultural process which implies transmission of values and meanings. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, and good morning to all of you. I would like to illustrate uh, what Sebastian just said about cultural heritage being a socio-cultural process, an experience, a negotiation, uh, by a small presentation that I have prepared for you this morning through a small presentation. And I would like to begin by asking a simple question to all of you. And uh, in some ways, the answer is implied. Is being able to play music at a social gathering or pose for a selfie, thank you. <laughs> uh, pose for a selfie in front of a historic monument, an indicator of peace? 
far away from the world of high level peace negotiations, what does peace feel like, look like, or taste like to people on the ground, to local communities that we have been speaking about since yesterday? Whether in South Sudan or in Syria or Kosovo, communities and families experience as well as continually renew peace through everyday activities such as being able to picnic at a heritage site. And this is, this is an, uh, you know, like a, an expression coming from Palestine where I was speaking to some uh, heritage specialists and some, um, some community members. But to be able to picnic at a heritage site or to celebrate festivals without the fear of persecu uh, persecution. So the idea of peace is very much related to what people do with heritage, whether it is to express identity, lay uh, claim over resources, seek connections with place, or exert power. Therefore, as Stefan said in the beginning, uh, as Sebastian said in the beginning, heritage is not static or frozen in time. And it enables socio-cultural processes through which established values and meanings are transmitted, yet at the same time, new meanings and values are created, which enable different groups to uh, constantly uh, uh, reconstruct identities and bring back elements of their past into their present and negotiate a future. So protecting and restoring physical heritage damaged by violent conflict is a laudable aim. We should protect heritage uh, in times of conflict. But the link between these actions and positive outcomes for building peace is rarely as straightforward as we hope. So I, uh, I, I'm stressing on the word physical heritage. Little effort has been made in our field to analyze the complex relations between heritage, conflict, peace, and individual freedoms, as also pointed out by Benedict last, uh, yesterday in the plenary. The lack of heritage-based metrics to measure peace has also placed many of the cultural heritage professionals that you see here in this conference in a difficult position. They bear a heavy responsibility to ensure that their inter interventions in that heritage safeguard do not harm and support peace, but they lack tools and guidance on how to do this. Therefore, as the interest in using heritage in peace building grows, there is a need to support this work with greater resources, targeted capacity development, and specific tools that help to measure the efficacy of heritage conservation heri or heritage conservation in, in times of crisis, in, especially in conflict situation, and heritage-based interventions. So addressing this gap in 2020, ECROM's first aid and resilience program with the support of the LF Foundation and in collaboration with Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation and the Center for Security Studies, which is based in Geneva, organized a capacity development program project called Alliance for Cultural First Aid, Peace and Resilience. The project focused on Middle East and North Africa, Afghanistan and Pakistan, a region that we all know uh, which, which is home to diverse and rich heritage, but is exposed to intersecting conflicts, climate change induced disasters, and health crises. The project uh, lasted uh, 30 months, engaging professionals and citizen volunteers. It consisted of online and in-person training, field projects, the project also had a training of trainers component in form of distance mentoring. As a key feature of this project, 
we introduced several uh, tools to help professionals to work in diverse conflict settings, ensuring that their heritage interventions remain relevant to the affected populations. One such tool that we introduced in the project was PATH, which is Peace Building Assessment Tool for Heritage Recovery and Rehabilitation. Now, it's a first of its kind tool that enhances the understanding of interplay between heritage and conflict dyna dynamics in a given context. Designed as a self-assessment and reflective tool, PATH enables its users, so it could be anybody, a community-based organization um, uh, that is working in a conflict setting, to identify the cultural diver drivers of a conflict that could prolong it or make, it, uh, make the conflict reoccur due to unresolved or newer grievances. The guiding questions and exercises in this tool, and it's available online, can be used at any stage of a heritage recovery and rehabilitation project. It is also available in Arabic, thanks to the project uh, that we did with Aleph. And it can be applied to diverse conflict contexts and different types of heritage. Conceived as a sequel to this tool that I just spoke about, PATH, we also developed community-based heritage indicators for peace, which reinforces the idea that access to cultural heritage and its enjoyment are basic human rights. Now, this tool, community-based heritage indicators for peace, presents a bottom-up approach to understand different ways in which heritage is used in times of peace and conflict, which can help to measure changes in peacefulness among different communities. Again, this tool is available in multiple languages and can be downloaded from uh, Ecrom website and hopefully shortly soon uh, also from the Aleph website. Then another very important tool that was introduced and field tested is the Insight tool, which we first developed with uh, Blue Shield uh, Georgia and it was field tested in Georgia and later on in many countries. It's called INSIGHT. It's a participatory vulnerability and capacity assessment method that uses a game approach to better understand how heritage is linked to a community's resilience and which capacities it generates that could help mitigate disaster and conflict risks as well as promote climate action. Besides these tools, Widely applicable, gu applicable guidelines and self-help videos to secure um, endangered heritage were also made available in local languages to multiply as well as standardized training, which was hands-on and simulation-based in this ALIF project that ECROM did. Post-training, the participants uh, 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 were given seed grants to develop community-based action to safeguard heritage with an aim to promote peace and resilience. So what did all these tools, all this training do? As a result, we had 16 field projects in eight countries, including Afghanistan, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Libya, Pakistan, South Sudan, and Yemen. And through these field projects, 20 cultural first aiders in turn trained 262 other professionals in their respective countries. So look at the scale of exponential scale of growth. And over 600 citizen volunteers were involved. Uh, and we improved emergency preparedness at seven World Heritage Sites. The focus of all these projects remain on what community considers as significant heritage. For example, a project in Yemen focused on safeguarding endangered recordings of songs and poems banned in parts of the country, and the local community was engaged in documenting and prioritizing the recorded content, while another project in Iraq documented Moselvi songs using a phone and web-based application. These songs are a source of resilience to 
people in Mosul who are trying to rebuild their lives, and as we saw in yesterday's powerful video testimony, these songs bear, a, uh, you know, they, they are witness to Mosul's multicultural past. Similarly, a project in South Sudan documented traditional songs and dance of the Mahdi, full of rich information on sustainable use of natural resources. The performance of these songs, the performances of these songs, provide opportunities for intercommunal dialogue and intergenerational exchange. So it's very important in South Sudan's uh, cultural life to have these performances. And as a result of this project with Alif, we were able to document some of these uh, performances and songs, and the, uh, the records are also stored in the National Archives of Sudan, which is, an, uh, again, a developing organization. In parallel to the Alliance to Cultural First Aid, and, and, and all, more, more of these uh, success stories of this project are in this publication. It's called A Story of Change, which is, again, available online. So in parallel to the alliance of uh, the project that I mentioned, Alliance for Cultural First Aid, Peace and Resilience, Ikram's FAR program is also working with survivors of the triple disaster in Sendai and the International Center for Disaster Research in Tohoku University, uh, and especially with Professor Machiko Kamiyama, who you can see her picture on the screen. She's a clinical psychologist who's trying to understand, and her, also her colleagues, how engaging citizens in heritage recovery can be a way to provide psychosocial first aid, enabling people to enhance their resilience and overcome trauma. This work is also informing our ongoing capacity development uh, project on heritage-based climate action as part of the, it's called Net Zero Heritage for uh, uh, Climate Action, I think I already said it, by training teams at five climate hotspots, this project aims to use traditional and indigenous uh, knowledge to develop integrated strategies for climate action, disaster risk reduction, and peace building. In nutshell, I will leave. I would like to emphasize that operationalizing the concept of heritage as a dynamic socio-cultural process is key to sustaining peace and development at grassroots levels. And the project that Elif funded was a bold step. We need more investment in such pro-peace bottom-up projects that engage vulnerable communities in enhancing peace and resilience in risk-prone regions of the world. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Aparna. Now let's continue with Krista Picat, who do represent UNESCO. Uh, this morning, you are director. Uh, your program is Cultural in Emergencies, and for the last 10 years, uh, you've been working in Central Asia on a different scale. You were in Almaty, in Kazakhstan, and you were in, in Tashkent, uh, also in Uzbekistan. Uh, and you're covering all the projects funded by Alif uh, in the name of UNESCO. Uh, just a little parenthesis, uh, uh, your secretary general is, not secretary general, your director, sorry, is in, uh, is in uh, uh, Mosul today, Audrey Azoulay. Uh, so we will talk uh, about Mosul uh, later on. Uh, can you explain us, uh, first of all, the tools of UNESCO, and that was roughly the strategy uh, toward the uh, problematic of this morning? Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, and uh, very good morning uh, to everybody. Um, so UNESCO, uh, of course, is a United Nations educational, scientific, and cultural organization, or, uh, actually established in the wake of the Second World War. Um, so uh, it's obvious that we have a very strong mandate in building peace. Uh, the constitution of UNESCO starts with the words, uh, since wars begin in the minds of men, and I should add women, it's in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, we, our main mandate is to build peace, and the fact that um, uh, the international community coming out of the Second World War 
felt that it was important to establish such an organization working in the fields of education, sciences and culture for peace demonstrates the linkage. So it's obvious uh, that culture contributes to uh, peace. And this has been also the, uh, the work of the organization over the past years. We have a set of normative uh, instruments, uh, the um, uh, conventions uh, covering actually different aspects of the sector of culture. And this is actually uh, the inter international agreement on uh, what the international community considers as values and standards in the field of culture. So we have been active uh, in promoting uh, these <coughs> standards sorry, at the international level, be it in the framework of the uh, negotiations on SDGs, um, to recognize the value of culture, not as something um, supplementary or recreational, but putting culture at the heart of development, but also promoting the nexus between hum humanitarian, uh, uh, economic and, uh, um, and sustainable development. Um, and this is also uh, comes very strongly out of a, um, a ministerial conference that UNESCO organized in Mexico in September, where 150 countries came together and declared that culture is a global public good. There is also a very strong uh, passage in the declaration adopted on the importance of culture in emergencies. So it's obvious that uh, UNESCO, of course, uh, promotes uh, culture in these contexts at the international level. We also um, uh, engage at the operational level, very often working with our different partners also present here. Mm, and we also have some interesting and challenging projects uh, uh, that we do in partnership with ALIF. Uh, uh, one in uh, Mali uh, to actually reconstruct the villages, uh, the villages in, in Banjagera. Uh, one in, uh, in um, Afghanistan and we, and we actually saw a témoignage, a, a, um, well, what's it in English? Um, Testimony, Testimony. Yes. Uh, yesterday uh, of a man saying uh, what the minaret of jam actually represented to the community and how important it, it was for their identity, uh, for their um, uh, history. Uh, and we also work in Iraq, as you said, and, and since our director general is indeed uh, in Iraq, I, I should probably mention that uh, this initiative uh, was um, uh, launched by our Director General in the immediate aftermath of the liberation uh, in 2018. And uh, it really demonstrates UNESCO's action uh, in, in the situations of emergency where we do not only re try to reconstruct the buildings to of course provide uh, the communities access or give them back access to their cultural heritage, to their history, to their identity, but we also recognize uh, the, uh, the culture, uh, other dimensions, uh, for instance, uh, the spirit, uh, the intangible cultural heritage, uh, the um, living heritage, the artistic communities. So the intervention, UNESCO's intervention, which is uh, quite large, uh, I, I, I think we are to the tune of uh, 100 million US dollars, uh, generously funded by the United Arab Emirates uh, and the Un European Union, whom I would like to thank. Uh, but also uh, the project uh, funded by Alif that actually concerns a house of prayer. And what is important there is that um, uh, when we reconstruct cities that uh, historically have been multicultural, uh, that we try to bring back this multicultural dimension uh, and that we focus on different ethnic communities and manifestations of different cultures. Uh, that's why UNESCO's intervention looks both at mosques, uh, the reconstruction of, uh, of mosques uh, and churches, and, and the Alif project is actually a um, uh, um, reconstruction of the House of Prayer, as I said, but to, to make this as a community center for educational and cultural activities. Uh, we, we have also worked to bring back, so how do you bring back uh, communities? How do you bring back people? It's when you actually give them opportunities to engage 
culturally to have a, a place of prayers, to have a, a place of, of community interaction, have a place of dialogue, uh, because this brings uh, social cohesion, this provides some opportunities uh, of dialogue uh, and healing and reconciliation. Um, so um, that's why we, we have also uh, focused uh, not only on culture, but also educational activities. Uh, and um, we do that um, uh, through uh, actually cash for work interventions that we have replicated also in other, in other contexts of, uh, of um, uh, conflicts and po post-conflict. Uh, because we believe that you, you have to work with communities so that these, uh, the trainings that uh, are provided um, are, will stay, that we provide sustainability of the project, that uh, uh, we, we bring back young people, we provide them with livelihood opportunities. Uh, this also uh, uh, boosts the economy of the country. Um, and, um, and also, of course, when we speak about education, it's, uh, it's also... The, the knowledge of the history, the knowledge that the cities have always been multicultural and that they take pride in that. And I, I will perhaps finish also with a, uh, uh, because you mentioned that yes, I was for a long time in, in Central Asia. Yes, because in Central Asia, well, it wasn't a post-conflict uh, uh, or, uh, or emergency situation, thankfully. Uh, but uh, the, the fact that Central Asia has always been at the crossroads of culture we also tapped into this uh, and uh, we very much focused uh, also uh, with support from the European Union on a Silk Road project that allowed us to build capacities of handicraft masters, uh, or of course make sure that the heritage is well protected, uh, especially those that are on the world heritage, um, but also to promote actually dialogue uh, all these countries around this common heritage. Uh, and uh, this was an, an important factor also in the development of tourism. And, and very often we see that tourism is actually the carrot that allows us to use culture uh, uh, and, and promote the economic value of culture. And, uh, and through that, uh, through recognizing uh, the economic return and interest uh, uh, in, in you know, helping also the communities get their livelihoods, uh, that we, we get the, uh, the um, recognition of this multicultural, multi-ethnic diversity that exists, uh, and that we also uh, transmit to the younger generations this uh, pride of these uh, uh, regions that have always existed as such, and that they celebrate diversity uh, that exists and take pride in it. Thank you very much, Krista. Maybe a word about this. A uh, program which has been launched in 2018 uh, revives the spirit of Mosul. I read like uh, two churches uh, uh, are under restoration, uh, one mosque and historic houses. This is really interesting. Exactly. This is what, what I mentioned. That, um, and and it's, uh, it's true that we, we also, um, because um, one of the challenges of Mosul was also the fact that not only the, the buildings were destructed, uh, but also the communities actually left the city. Uh, so it was important also that we not only looked at mosques and churches, but we also tried to revive um, the uh, historic center. And that's why uh, we have reconstructed 125 historic buildings. And as I, uh, as I mentioned, we do this with local communities, with uh, bringing back young people, transmitting them the skills and allowing them to reconstruct their city. Thank you very much, Christophe. Vincent, nous allons nous exprimer en français. Bonjour, going to speak bonjour, in Vincent, French. Good morning, Vincent Scayol. You represent L'Oeuvre d'Orient, which is an, a French NGO, very old NGO that has more than 160 years old. Uh, could you please first uh, present uh, your organization? What is its action? And what is uh, your uh, point? Uh, what is your uh, idea about uh, heritage? So, Oeuvre d'Orient was created in 1866 by two professors in Sorbonne, in Sorbonne University, two mathematicians 
who were very impressed by the massacres in uh, Lebanon and in Damascus. And since then, uh, this, uh, unfortunately, this has continued. So we are still very active in the Middle East. In particular, we are supporting the Christian communities uh, to achieve their mission, uh, which is uh, at the service of the whole community. And that is what we are doing for more than 160 years. Our action is mainly, we are very near to the community. Maybe it's a bit, a bit atypical because we are centered in the uh, Christian community. And uh, we are we really try to uh, build a very strong ties. Uh, so maybe uh, we can uh, help uh, some uh, uh, religious sisters in the mountains. But this community knows that every year they will get this constant uh, help. So. We are funded by uh, private uh, funds. We've got 80, mainly 80 persons who regularly give us money. We have an office in Brussels. Uh, we also work with private and public institutions, in particular Alif, which, uh, whom we work since the beginning. We have eight projects in Eritrea, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, that represented 3.5 million euros. So your network is the, a network of churches, but the communities that are the beneficiaries of your help are really uh, all uh, belong to all um, religious, right? Yes, of course. This is our mission. The mission is to work for everybody. The schools are a good example of that. In Gaza, we have three Christian schools, and 99% of the students are non-Christians. And this is why uh, uh, education is our main uh, mission, our historical mission, because this uh, 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 this education will bring peace tomorrow. So we are helping 400 schools in the Middle East. Could you please tell us about the Mosul Mosaic? This is a, a project that you are really uh, very involved in. We ha you have found uh, different partnerships regarding this project. Yes, so Mosul Mosaic is a project started a few years ago with Alif. The idea is to uh, make the restoration of some uh, religious uh, buildings in Mosul. Uh, Alif uh, uh, put together uh, different players, so we are uh, already working in two old churches in the center of Mosul and two other organizations like Archimedia who are present here who are also building two mosques. The idea is Mosaic represents uh, both communities, and I think Alif uh, wanted to, to also uh, renovate other buildings. So we have two old churches that we are repairing and rebuilding. So there have been a lot of difficulties, scientific difficulties, and also a lot of uh, paperwork and uh, problems. But uh, L'Oeuvre d'Orient, for us, this is not our core activity. For us, heritage, um, we are uh, involved in heritage because uh, since 2018, 2011, sorry, we helped this uh, religious community to preserve their uh, heritage. Heritage is very uh, important part of l'Oeuvre d'Orient work, and uh, uh, particularly in north of Iraq. So is it the local community who called you and who raised awareness? Yes, of course, we play every day with these uh, northern Iraq communities. These communities are very near Mosul, 20 kilometers from Mosul. They are in Herbil which is 80 kilometers from Mosul, and they are waiting 
de pouvoir revenir chez elle. Alors, nous avions to déjà reconstruit deux églises. To go back to their house, so we have rebuilt two churches that are not so interesting in the heritage point of view. But now, the communities are really looking forward to go back to their beautiful churches. That now they are really, you know, being restored. So last question, Vincent Cayol, which has, which has been the difficulties at the beginning? How do you develop this new uh, way to work in just a few months? So first, we need to um, reinforce our skills internally, but also uh, working with experts. So we work with expert architects, like the architect that uh, restored restored the Mahmedan Mausoleum, which is uh, 30 kilometers uh, from Mosul. Uh, so all these elle, skills elle also are locales. added with local skills. Uh, we have great uh, engineers in Iraq, really great et architects et also. Uh, so we work with uh, this team of uh, professionals to do things the way they should be done. Uh, you also, we also said yesterday that we don't build, let's say, uh, something uh, that is just a decoration that is superficial. No, we are uh, working towards the future. With our activities, uh, we know some of these religious uh, communities. One is called the Little Sisters of Jesus. So these uh, communities have a mission, which is to uh, live among Muslims. And this uh, religious community who now went to Erbil, I went back to their original site, and they saw that their house had become just some uh, ruins, and they were really really sad about this situation. And they, talk, uh, they started talking about the community, and the community were asking them, where are you coming back? So I'm really glad to see that now this religious community could go back to Mosul and could start again their work with the community. Thank you very much. Before continuing, with our next topic, we're going to watch a small video. An agreement reached between Greek Cypriot and Turkish Cypriot leaders under the auspices of the United Nations in 2008 paved the way for the Technical Committee on Cultural Heritage. Dedicated to the promotion and protection of Cyprus's cultural heritage, the Technical Committee continues to provide mechanisms for the preservation and restoration of cultural heritage in Cyprus today. The committee believes that protecting cultural heritage is an integral part of the ongoing process of broadening areas of cooperation between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, which can most effectively be achieved through joint efforts. The fruits of this cooperation have resulted in the completion of 88 projects by the technical committee, with the support of the United Nations Development Programme, in addition to the European Union, the largest donor of the committee, various donors from the island also contribute to the ongoing work of the technical committee. Thanks to these valuable partnerships, numerous churches, mosques, fountains, archaeological sites, parts of the Nicosia walls, the fortifications in Farmagusta and hammams were conserved. Located all across Cyprus, these monuments and sites are a testament to the shared heritage of the island. So far, more than 7,000 Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots have been involved in the realization of the committee's projects, leading to increased cooperation and collaborations. Each project of the committee has been an opportunity to build confidence, foster trust and achieve joint results. Many civilizations have passed through Cyprus, which has a history that exceeds 10,000 years. The traditions and customs of all these civilizations 
live with us through our monuments. They are the integral part of the cultural heritage and richness of this island. As members of the technical committee, we acknowledge the responsibility of preserving and sustaining this richness so it can be handed over to future generations. And we are proud to be able to promote through such a valuable endeavor. We believe in the spirit of cooperation and with this spirit, we are determined to work in harmony to continue contributing to our island's cultural richness. Whatever we divide and destroy, united and together we restore for a multicultural and peaceful Cyprus. The work of the Technical Committee does not end with the conservation of monuments and sites. It continues by providing opportunities for the engagement of the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots, especially involving the youth of the island of Cyprus. Through strong partnerships, shared vision and combined strength, the Technical Committee on Cultural Heritage will continue achieving its goals. So we have uh, three persons who will uh, speak this morning about Cyprus, Sotos, uh, Jack Onger for UNDP and Ali Ali Tunjai that we saw on the film. So uh, Sotos, you are not on the film, it's your predecessor which was on the film. <laughs> if I may ask you, uh, the first question is to explain us a little bit what is this concept of technical committee uh, which has been developed in Cyprus. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Allow me firstly to give some historical information very briefly, Sebastian. Uh, in Cyprus, there is since the 1960s an ongoing political conflict. And for most of that period, uh, the prevailing attitude on the island, the prevailing attitude amongst Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots was to blame each other for the destruction of cultural heritage monuments. Besides these blame game tactics, it is a fact that uh, the evolution of the Cyprus problem had grave ramifications on the cultural heritage of the island. So as stated already in the video, in 2008, the respective leaders of the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots, they acknowledged this reality. They acknowledged that adversarial and confrontational policies and tactics would have inevitably led to the destruction of most of the island's monuments. It is this realization that led to the establishment of the committee, which was the first real joint effort to address the issue of preservation of cultural heritage on the island. And this indeed constituted a historical shift from the confrontational uh, approaches of the past. Not only because the policies of instrumentalizing cultural heritage for the achieving political goals uh, was abandoned, but thereafter, because cultural heritage became a mechanism of cooperation, peace building, and reconciliation. When, when we established the committee back in 2008, the, I think the basic parameters we agreed upon were to establish an efficient mechanism where all major decisions were made by consensus. This is very important. The second important parameter was that we agreed on a common vision on cultural heritage, which basically states that all monuments inherited to us by history were to be considered without any distinction as the common shared heritage of all people residing on the island of Cyprus. And the third very important parameter we agreed upon was that we wanted to isolate our procedures from the negotiation, from the political negotiation process for the solution of the Cyprus problem in order to avoid inevitable negative political implications that would definitely arise for the resolution of a very difficult international problem that has been in the international fora for more than uh, 60 years now. I think we have managed to do that. In 2008, so we have the establishment of the committee. In 2010, we have a very important development when the European Union decides to concretely support our work in Cyprus. And in 2012, we, we start the actual implementation projects on the ground. Since then, 123 monuments uh, have been restored or preserved. 
a very important number, which includes significant religious uh, sites of great semiological and symbolic significance for all Cypriots, archaeological sites, secular monuments. But I think it would have been uh, wrong to refrain the success of this committee only to the preservation of the monuments. I think one of the major contributions of this committee was that it had managed, managed to raise awareness and respect amongst people of Cyprus for the monuments of all communities. And most importantly, I would say, it had managed to credibly challenge cultural stereotypes and narratives of historical animosity. Um, I know that you work also in education, that uh, on bicommunal project that you bring uh, uh, schools together uh, to visit places and to explain the process of uh, uh, not reconciliation only, but uh, to know the culture of uh, each other. Uh, what would be your recommendation or advices uh, for some people who could be here or could be advocating your model uh, that you would maybe give? Even I don't know, I, don't, I think you don't like the word success, but the Technical Committee on Cultural Heritage is really a success. So to, to concentrate on the technical approaches in order to avoid political implications, to show patience, you can only achieve long-term results by being patient, to be flexible, to understand the position of your co-members in the committee from the other community, to be able to see their challenges as well, to see their problems, and act accordingly in a constructive manner, not to publicize negative developments, never. This undermines the legitimacy of the whole project in the society. To engage communities in order to address the issue of sustainability and the issue, the very important issue of maintenance uh, as well. And in general, to try to use this mechanism not only for the preservation of monuments, but in an effort to challenge dominant, intangible, and nationalistic narratives on the public sphere is very important as well. Thank you. <laughs> Jack on gear, you represent UNDP in Cyprus. Uh, your uh, participation is essential to that process because you are the facilitator of the whole process. So can you explain Explain us, technically speaking, how it works and what is your vision of the Technical Committee and the future of, of the heritage in Cyprus. Thank you, Sebastian. First of all, <clears throat> thank you very much for the organizers and inviting us. It's a great opportunity. As you know, UNDP works in 170 countries. It's a leading UN agency on international development. We work in three main areas, which is um, sustainable development, democracy and peace building where this, uh, you know, our support to technical committee falls and uh, climate and uh, disaster resilience. Specifically in Cyprus, our work is to support the work of the committee. This is our paramount, uh, you know, goal uh, to enable them to deliver on the promises and also to bring more uh, reconciliation and promote the dialogue and, uh, you know, build confidence. Et, et en addition à cela, on, a, on, apporte des, on apporte des expertises, soutenant-les dans différents domaines, dans différents focus on when they implement this project, which is, you know, uh, overall based, uh, you know, values of humanities, gender, human rights, no harm, you know, etc. So this is what we offer, but I think we're looking more. It's uh, all our projects are funded with the uh, generous funding with the European Union, which are very grateful. And now we are proud to be partners with Alif, specifically to Valerie and your team, to Sebastian, French ambassador in Cyprus, who facilitated this work. We are very proud to expand But overall goal is, again, to bring communities to the heritage to more, you know, peaceful, you know, uh, coexistence, regardless of political dimensions that Sotos mentioned. That's the paramount. And I think personally that cultural heritage plays a most important role in this because it's like the history, but also it's present and the future, future generations. We mentioned the youth, you know, uh, how we're focusing on youth. I think 
what we leave for future generations is very important. And we are very uh, grateful to all experts present here. This work is enormous. And uh, I was just referring that, no, like we work in the post-conflict or frozen conflict scenario. In some places we operate after the conflict, uh, you know, crisis happened. But what to do during crisis? I think Alif is doing great, you know, example of this work. Like, I don't want to bring this comparison, but ICRC, they operate in the, during crisis to saving human lives, etc. So cultural heritage is, is very important for humans. I think we need to be able to operate even during crisis to preserve this heritage for the, for the better of the future generations. So Thank your you. idea at Icon is to create a Red Cross for heritage. So uh, it can Pardon me? You, can, you want to create, you want to, to inspire a Red Cross for heritage. Yes, I think this is what we need to do. I think we have the scenarios, we have excellent expertise around, but what to do during crisis is very important. Again, we operate in post-frozen conflict scenarios after the incidents unfortunately happened, but again, ICRC is, is able to operate okay. in the domain during. But I think it's a, it's a very important discussion we'll be looking for that. One last question, uh, Jack Ongier, about Cyprus. When you arrived in Cyprus, you didn't know anything, I guess, about the technical committee. So you learn everything on the ground by listening to the people and the, uh, the, co the two co-chair uh, who, who are here this morning. Uh, do you think this system can be implemented in different con conflicts, uh, post-war zone, or uh, how do you see that from a UNDP point of view? I think it's, a, it's one of the best practices that uh, happen naturally. We don't see in many places this, uh, you know, the committees that establish a political commitment. Also, we would try to avoid the politicization of the war, but this was the commitment to establish this platform for the two, you know, uh, uh, communities to interact. I think it's very important. The UN brings this, you know, more implementation, like we have these signature solutions on procurement, HR, other administrative, that helps them to focus on the main work that they're doing. I think this combination is, is very, you know, uh, important, uh, also from the cost effectiveness, uh, you know, side, because we, we focus on delivery, while they focus mainly, I support these two very great people to focus on the main, you know, overall overreaching goal of this pre preserving cultural heritage for peace and, and conflict prevention. I think that's combination. They need us and we need them to be able to deliver. I think this, you know, combined efforts, they bring these results that you saw in the, in the beginning. Thank you, Jack Ongier. Please. Ali Tunjai, uh, you represent uh, the technical committee from the beginning of it. You participated more than 15 years ago, if I remember well, about the beginning, how it started from your personal experience, Ali? Actually, uh, my colleague and friend uh, Sotos mentioned it very clearly. There was this ongoing blame game and each, each side was blaming each other for the destruction of the heritage, destruction of the religious buildings. But I mean, we were not reaching anywhere actually. Destruction was continuing, but I mean, we were not solving this problem. So, I mean, uh, in the case of Cyprus, I mean, we were, we are more luckier than other conflicts, actually. It was not a religious conflict, it was a nationalist one. And apart from a few examples, there was not, there wasn't any deliberate destruction of the uh, others, let's say, other groups, monuments, actually. In our case, the main problem was abandonment, because there was this movement of populations, and lack of maintenance, actually. I mean, after 50 or 60 years, I mean, I mean, without maintenance, I mean, I think it's, uh, we can easy, easily actually imagine what would have happened to those monuments without the communities. So, uh, initially, I mean, we tried to understand the problem, actually. We, we conducted many visits to all over the island, to mountains, I mean, to the mountain villages and everywhere, actually to understand the problem. And uh, we realized that, we, I mean, we had to deal with at least 500 abandoned religious monuments. And apart from this, we also realized that uh, there are also secular monuments. 
which which also needed our attention on both sides of the island. So, I mean, with this understanding, I mean, we started to prioritize the monuments according to their needs. And uh, actually, initially, we were not, I mean, I mean, we were aware that we need some funding to do something, but there was no funding. And in, in the first two or three years, we were going around, and I remember we were cleaning the churches, mosques, I mean, uh, we were trying to repair the windows and gates. Uh, luckily, in 2010, uh, 9 and 10, European Union approached to us, uh, first to actually finance a very comprehensive uh, study on the inventory of the monuments, so we managed to do at least 2003, we managed to, to, go, to complete the inventory of 2,300 monuments. And uh, upon this experience, EU started to give us money in 2012, and we managed to work in the field. So Thank this you. was the beginning. Thank you very much, Ali. Can you tell us a few words about the project uh, uh, financed by Alif? Uh, from your own town, uh, Famagusta. Yes, I am. Yes, I mean, I am from Famagusta. I mean, uh, it's the pearl of, let's say, Cyprus and Eastern Mediterranean. But, uh, you know, due to this political problem, uh, you know, there is an internationally recognized government and there is another administration which is not internationally recognized. And this, uh, actually, we were not able, as the Turkish Cypriots, to get international funding, technical help, and other means to deal with the uh, protection of the cultural heritage. And Famagusta was uh, a victim of this. I mean, as the committee, we worked a lot in Famagusta. We managed to save, uh, work with the, I mean, the walls and uh, with some uh, actually medieval, let's say, uh, churches. Apart from this, uh, thanks to Alif uh, Valeri, we were together in Famagusta. Uh, we, are, we decided to work on two monuments, actually. One is the St. George of Latins in Famagusta, which is actually in ruins. It was, I mean, it collapsed during the Ottoman siege, actually, but it is one of the earliest and most important, let's say, uh, Lusania monuments in Cyprus. So I mean, uh, so I mean, what we will do there with the contribution of Alif and their donors? Uh, actually, we will do, uh, let's say, a conservation study there, at least to freeze the situation and to prevent the collapse and uh, loss of the, this imp very important monument. And we are also doing another monument in Lanaka. Uh, this is uh, Tuzla Mosque. This is a very interesting monument, actually. It, I mean, it started as a basilica, then an Orthodox church, then a Catholic church, and when the Ottomans conquered uh, Cyprus, they added a minaret and some uh, other, uh, actually, facilities to, and to use it as a mosque. So, I mean, it's a very impressive monument. I think you are also very, actual, actually, influenced from that monument. So, uh, we will also do some minimum conservation there. And uh, we will, I, I hope we will manage to save these very, very important monuments, which has uh, actually very imp important implications for the uh, cultural heritage of our beautiful island. Thank you very much. Congratulations, gentlemen. <laughs> we have a few minutes left, dear Sneska. Um, the transition is very easy for me because you represent uh, Europa Nostra and the Technical Committee uh, uh, received an award in 2021 uh, from Europa Nostra. So uh, you went to Cyprus several times, so what is your feeling about this experience? I always have a smile on my face when I listen to this story, when I watch the realization uh, of the uh, Technical Committee, and I always think how ingenious that you, the idea that you call it a technical committee like that to say, no, we don't have anything to do with politics, but it's so much more than technical. Uh, it is using cultural heritage as a bridge, as a bridge between the hearts and minds of the communities uh, uh, in, in Cyprus. And um, 
So it is one of the most extraordinary examples uh, in Europe uh, um, of using cultural heritage in, in a country that has been so much wounded, a society that has been wounded by conflict, and it still is, and uh, in the best possible way um, uh, to, to sort of uh, try to continue overcoming uh, these wounds uh, through cultural heritage. So we were very, very proud. So I was proud uh, in, 20, in 2021, we were sharing the same stage in Venice when we had our big European uh, Heritage Award ceremony. And not only you got an award, you got a Grand Prix uh, <laughs> for what uh, you have been doing. So we are very, very proud. And I must say that, you know, I, I'm very glad also, Valérie, that um, sort of the, the, the initiative that we have as Europa Nostra identified as really excellence, the power of example, celebrating of these uh, initiatives, that you are now, in fact, Alif is supporting their work. And uh, there is another example of such a winner, and I see the director of the National Museum in Bosnia, Herzegovina, from uh, Sarajevo, uh, also a winner of, uh, uh, of our uh, Grand Prix uh, back when we have uh, um, sort of applauded the em employees and activists who were fighting to preserve that museum. They were going uh, to work three years without getting a salary because they wanted to save this uh, museum. And that now Alif is also supporting that. I think this is a wonderful example also of how uh, uh, an organization like Europa Nostra, which is not a foundation, so we do not helas have uh, 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 funds to give to, uh, to, to heritage projects and initiatives, but we can identify extraordinary uh, projects, uh, uh, the ones that reserve an award or uh, projects that need uh, support. Like, for example, if we are speaking of uh, Bosnia, we also have a seven most endangered program. And, and so we, we have now uh, nominated this year among the shortlisted project, uh, uh, the Partisan Memorial Cemetery in Mostar, an extraordinary memorial of uh, sort of, uh, and, and, and celebration of anti-fascist uh, uh, battle in, uh, and, and struggle in, in former Yugoslavia, which has been vandalized and it really needs the support. And I think this is really a lot of examples uh, also in Europe uh, that uh, Alif and, and I think Europa Nostra uh, could uh, join forces uh, and, and make a difference. Sneska, I would like to ask you a last question. Uh, in the definition of the scope of action of Europa Nostra, there is a, a, a monuments restoration and campaigns, uh, the seven most ended heritage program. But there is another concept which is very interesting and kind of unique is a cultural landscape. Can you tell us more about it? Again, cultural landscape, I also want to speak about intangible heritage. I think you were, were going to ask me about that. I hope we'll come it's to that as it. well. <laughs> uh, but cultural landscape, definitely. Uh, and by, by the way, I have here uh, also uh, the, the publication with all the winners, because there is always an enormous variety. And cultural landscape, yes, indeed, because we, if we are talking about monuments and sites, there is the, 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 the environment, surrounding environment is extremely, extremely important. And in Europe today, like in the rest of the world, the landscape is even more endangered than, um, uh, than monuments itself. Monuments are endangered in, in, in term, when, it, when we have conflicts, when we have violence, when, uh, when we have wars. But in peacetime, landscapes are immensely endangered by all sorts of developments that are not um, uh, sustainable and that are not uh, in line with, with, with all the st high standards uh, that Europe and the world have developed for the protection of cultural landscapes. And they are also including the urban landscapes and historical urban landscape, but also in rural areas. So this is something that we, uh, we feel very strong about it. And, um, and there are some, some examples of, of, of cultural landscape that were on our list of seven most endangered, for example, and that is uh, 
Roșia Montana in, in, in Romania, uh, the, the historic mining landscape, and was very much in the danger of, um, of, of again, a very um, brutal way of, of uh, gold mining and extracting gold in a very polluting way. And um, citizens, civil society organization got, uh, got to act together and um, believe it or not, not only they're not doing uh, gold mining, it is now on the World Heritage List it's in danger because still the threat of that landscape exists. Sneska, one minute, please, about intangible heritage. I know you're really uh, focusing on that question, but in one minute, please. In one minute, yeah. I just want to you know why I'm wearing this, this blouse uh, today, uh, paying tribute to my colleagues from uh, Ukraine, and uh, I proudly got this Vishivanka uh, in Prague when uh, the Vishivanka World uh, Day, uh, World Vishivanka Day NGO got uh, the Public Choice Award uh, in, in Prague. This is an extraordinary example of, of uh, the resilience uh, of, of our Ukrainian colleagues and friends, Ukrainian people, about the, the sense of pride that they have in their identity. And this embroidered um, um, blouse is so much more than a blouse. Uh, uh, now I'm learning about it and wearing with your, your permission also today, uh, because this is also a symbol of resilience. I learned that embroideries, it means also stitching, stitching pain, stitching life, stitching after so many sufferings that, that they're, they're having. So I have a dream, I have a dream that uh, that initiative also, World Vishivanka Day, uh, they are now building a museum uh, in, in the city that is all started and that also there will be an exhibition of the importance of the uh, Vishivanka blouse at, 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 and a symbol also for all of us. But this is also a message, uh, give me one minute more, message for um, Alif, uh, Alif uh, because we are so proud to be, I would say, a partner and a member of your family, of, uh, the family of, uh, I would say, Valérie and friends tribe. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary family that you have gathered all here and I think that we can do more together um, in order to, um, to show that peace is not only absence of shooting. Uh, there is so much to be done on the longer term to promote peace in the hearts and minds of the people. And I think your budget of about 100 million euro, it sounds like a great budget, but it is the price of 10 kilometers of highways building. What is the price of building peace? I think you, de you deserve to have a budget of 10 times more, at least 100 kilometers of a highway, it's worth. So I think together we can do that ac activism, action, 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 and convince the European Union, I think they could much more support this time of action, and we stand there to do that action together with you, because it's also about solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Leshna. Thank you all for this fantastic panel, I have to say. Now let's have a coffee break. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. <laughs>